Hi, this is James Shogum, host of Webcomics Reviews and Interviews. Today, we're talking with Anubis from the Bloodbound Webcomic. So sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest begin. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you. G'day, my name's Anubis. I am the creator, writer, artist, human resources manager, and total idiot who tried to create a webcomic in 2006. That was supposed to last about six months worth of TNA, and somehow in 2019 it's still going on, and I don't know where the TNA went. I take it there's a major art change since uh, since the beginning. No, there was a there seems to be a, a bit of a change in the direction of the comic. I was uh, going to do it simply as a way of relieving a bit of loneliness. And I was young, and uh, for some reason, instead of going the way I intended, it developed into its own story. And the characters ended up getting names when they weren't going to be named. The story ended up becoming more complex when it was just simply going to be a very quick and easy little bit of fun for me to relieve some stress. And somehow it became the most major stress in my life. (laughs) <laughs> Sounds like kids. <laughs> uh, sometimes I feel like they are. All right. Uh, just because, uh, how would you describe Bloodbound? I wouldn't. But uh, if you put me on the spot, I would put it as a story taken out of the whole the monsters are hidden amongst humanity type thing. But I left out the humanity. So instead of having it from the human's point of view, like you see so many times, uh, humans basically are just the background slash food slash entertainment slash whatever. Uh, and I concentrated largely on the creatures that are existing in their own society amongst us. It's one of the criticisms I've gotten in the past is the fact I did it from the quote monsters end quote point of view rather than actually having humans being the major part of the comic but quite frankly we've seen enough of that sort of stuff and I wanted the creatures the inhumans as they're referred to in the comic to actually take center stage instead of just being the antagonists for the human heroes well that's a shame I mean like I agree totally I mean we've seen way too it's nice to see a comic because it's actually based on the monster point of view. And then I turned around and tried to make the monsters as normal as possible. They have family, they have friendships, they go to work, they deal with everything that a human would deal with. It's just it's the non-humans that are dealing with them. Uh, some things are a little bit more extreme. Uh I have uh, put religion in there. Each particular species has their own religion. Uh, I base their religions loosely on different religions that humans have. Uh, the humans you are atomists, so they worship Adam, so we can guess where that came from. Vampires have Lilith. Uh, there's Nyx for the, the uh, succubi and the incubi. And that's all based on different things. And I've got various different species of different religions uh, of creatures. You've got the wares who uh, basically the werewolves, um, one of the characters who was originally in a self-insert and he's developed his own personality and traits. Uh, I am not afraid to say I inserted myself into the comic and then he ran away and did his own thing. Man, I hate when characters do that kind of thing. Yeah, it's like you lose control of the story. Uh, as I said, it was supposed to be six months and basically pin-up shots. And I have no idea what happened. No. Uh, just because it looks like, uh, first off, yeah, there's been a lot There's been a lot of interesting characters in there. And for something that definitely was started off as a pin-up, definitely went south, so to speak. No, it would not sell as a pin-up. In fact, uh, I, when I do have nudity in there, the nudity is portrayed as being ordinary. Uh, people waking up and getting out of bed, they're not looking good, their hair's scruffy. Um, they, 
it's I almost completely desexualized their nudity as much as I possibly can and made it look like uh, when a person wakes up in the morning, perhaps they sleep with nothing on and they're just going to the toilet. And that's basically how I tried to portray it as much as I can. Yeah, it definitely worked. I mean, there, like you pointed out, there is a lot of nudity, but it isn't. It's not like a Cinemax type of thing where it's basically we're trying to be ultra sexy type of deal. Yes, I tried to avoid that. So, um, and like you said, character. Yeah, from what I've been reading of the comics, it's definitely been getting a little bit more complicated as far as the uh, the plotting goes. Unfortunately, yes, it gets uh, a bit complex for me, and I lose the plot. Uh, it's at the point now where I'm looking over the fence and watching what they're doing, writing it down, running back to the computer and trying to create it. So, so I'm guessing sometimes you feel like you're a little bit behind on the story then. Uh, yeah, sometimes I feel that way. Uh, sometimes I have plots and storylines which go nowhere and I have to try and fight to find some way of finishing it so that you know, we can move on. And I've had a couple of cases where I look back and I see like a chapter and I think to myself, that really does not work at all. But it's still on there and still the archives are still there and I'm very slowly going through my entire archive and redoing it and new software packages that I've got to recomposite uh, all of the old stuff into the new format so it can be printed again. How, uh, how much have you printed so far? I did three comics about ten years ago. Uh, I've got copies of them myself. Um, they're no longer for sale. Uh, the art in them is bad. The spelling is bad. Uh, and, and everything's getting redone. There's been minor changes to things that have happened. Some pages have been literally removed because they were unnecessary. Uh it's one of the good things about webcomic is you can go back and change it. Especially if something you want to bring up in a comic which should have been referenced to in a previous comic somewhere two, three, five, ten years ago, you can sneak back, add that, upload it. Oh, it's been there all the time. Yeah, you got to love that feature to it. Yeah, so... Uh, that's one of the good things about having it on the web is I can retroactively edit something into it so that I can sort of sneakily claim that that was always there. I don't know what you're talking about. But as soon as it's all finished and uh, yeah, edited all and uh, put into uh, Clip Studio Pro properly, I can then perhaps uh, print a, like a big version of it and give it to a couple of people who have been uh, helping me with all of this and, of course, have my own copy and turn around and say, look, I'm a printed a comic artist, aren't I wonderful, even though I had it printed myself. I don't really see that as a major issue anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of like you used to have like the vanity presses of way back when, and now since everybody's using some variation of print-on-demand, it's just... Yeah, that's what I did originally was uh, print-on-demand. Uh, I did Kablam was my print-on-demand uh, company, and I'd be going back to them again because they do a really, really good job with printing uh, work and helping out with uh, any issues that they may pop up in any pages. So when I did print way back when, they actually said, hey, can you redo this page a little bit because it's affecting our printing it doesn't seem to fit properly, and I was able to fix it, and they were really helpful. So I love Kablam for uh, print-on-demand. Have you thought about reusing somebody else, sir? I did once try a different company, and I, for the life of me, can't remember what it was called, but they were long, slow, expensive, and... Uh, I haven't really researched any others since I used Kablam because I've not been printing for at least 10 years. But uh, I keep an eye on Kablam to make sure it's still, like, going. Yeah. I think out of the various printers, print-on-demand service I've seen, 
I definitely would recommend it for comics. Yeah. So. I would not recommend them for a novel, but for comics and for graphic novels, yeah, they seem to be doing a really good job with that. And they will help you with the changes with ISBN numbers, and they have their own online store that you can sell through, uh, and uh, that way you can get a couple more issues sort of printed and sent out to wonderful people who decide that they like your work and are willing to spend a reasonable amount of money for it. No. I mean, I definitely, I mean, just because you might want to also check out Lulu, but that's because they tend to have the a little bit wider range in terms of printing options. And I think I looked at Lulu again about 10, 15, uh, 10 12 years ago. Uh, that's as far as I went back then. Um, it would be something I may look at again uh, if and or when I actually decide to uh, bring it all together into one volume. Yeah, I mean, as far as comic goes, Kablam is definitely the place to go. We won't talk about Amazon. <laughs> yeah, I uh, downloaded their software for comic book stuff, and I, yeah, no, that's. Uh, I love Amazon. They are a wonderful company for getting some wonderful stuff, but uh, no, they're not going to print my stuff. Yeah, I think my major issue is they don't have saddle stitch as an option available. Well, when I uh, actually combine everything, I mean, there's at the moment there's what seven hundred odd pages worth of comic, and uh, saddle stitch would definitely not be an option for trying to put that together. Yeah. Well, I mean, for most comics, it pretty much is. So. Yeah. Well, my smaller comics, it was done definitely done uh, with saddle stitch. Um, have you done, have you tried to do any uh, uh, local comic book shops or anything like that? I did when I was living in Australia. I actually had some sold through a store in Adelaide, and I had a, a gothic store in Melbourne who was interested. Uh, at that was uh, quite a few years ago. Um, because I haven't been continuing the printing process, I have not uh, been going through to any of the local stores where I am now, Since, especially since I've moved to the United States. Uh, I barely have enough time to actually make the comic itself rather than also trying to do everything else. The obvious question is, are you, how, how's the financing for the comic going then? I pay for everything. I, um, the amount of money I get through patrons uh, helps pay a little bit, uh, but the, I do self-hosting and all that sort of stuff. I, um, all the assets I use, most of that comes out of my own pocket. So it comes out of uh, working where I'm working uh, as well as a little bit from my wonderful patrons. Yeah, I hate asking you, but what's your expenses for the comic on a monthly basis? Uh, let's see. Or the annual, however you prefer. It's a, at least a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a year worth of expenses. So it's not overly much, but when you're a low income person like me, it can be quite expensive. Right. That's including hosting and SSL and all that sort of wonderful stuff and. Acquiring assets, uh, software upgrades, uh, hardware especially is it really can be quite hard on the hardware. Uh, I uh, do my comic as a unusual mixture of two and three D put together. I sort of do a two point five D system, so I have to acquire more assets through that because I actually have difficulty, literally have difficulty with drawing is and with a. a little bit of brain damage that I've got so that's why I use uh, another s software to actually help with the art itself um, yeah you mentioned something like uh, do you use Daz 3D a lot? I use Daz 3D uh, and I use Clip Studio Pro so a lot of your comic is uh, to, uh, sorry is created through the Daz 3D program with a little bit of uh, added extra and there's a little, only a little bit from you actually drawing in there then? There's a fair amount of me actually trying to draw in there, try being the operative word, particularly with effects, compositing, and all that sort of stuff. Um, Deus 3D gives you a very nice 
uh, cell shading for the figures. I used my own materials for the actual flesh and all that sort of stuff, so I had to design all that myself. Uh, from there, I went and uh, it, it gets composited in, so I may use other assets. I then have to re rig and re skin everything, so all that's done manually as well, including some work in Photoshop to try and organize things because. You know, something will look really, really good in color that they've actually done. And when you actually render it, and then you've got to desaturate it because everything's in color for all the backgrounds and stuff. And it doesn't come out looking that pleasing. I've got to go through and reorganize all of that. It's uh, Sometimes doing a page can be very, very quick. Other times doing a page could take me a week and a half. Yeah. And just because uh, there's absolutely, I just don't think there should be any problem with you doing your own, um, using a computer program in order to do the art, because there's plenty of comics out there that do it. Uh, most notably, House of Muses by um, Pam Pam Anderson or Harrison, yes, sorry, yes. Um, I looked at that, and uh, uh, there is a lot of comics that, out there that use Daz Studio or use Poser, and um, a lot of them look good, and but I don't want mine to look exactly the same as all of them. That's why I've created a sort of manga-ish feel to it by having a different form of materials, different forms of cell shading to cry, try and create a semi-drawn yet 3D-ish look to it. Definitely. I mean, you've got basically a uh, black and white cell shading with a little bit of uh, splashes of color every so often. Yes, uh, I did that to start off with when I first started, and then someone turned around and says, "Oh, did you go see that movie Sin City?" And I said, "What? Since what is Sin City?" They said, "Oh, they do the same sort of thing. It's all black and white with a little piece of color." Uh, you copying them? Uh, never heard of it. Yeah, we hit. My uh, <laughs> And, I, and you hit my I hate cinephiles who have absolutely no background in cinema. Well, I've still not seen that movie. Uh, first off, you should. Um, fun <laughs> movie. I mean, if you, if you don't mind a little bit of violence, and yeah, just a little bit of violence, it's a pretty good movie. Um, but it's it, Frank. But it's Frank Miller, so I don't mind violence. It doesn't offend me much. It's kind of like Beauty, right? Yes, it's not that offensive. So I'm te I'm teasing. I'm teasing. No, um, I haven't seen it. I it is on my bucket list, for want of a better phrase. But at the moment, I'm all kaijuing at the moment. You have a favorite monster? Uh, Repta. Cool. Wait. Uh, <laughs> you're trying to figure out where's Repta from? I actually know that Repta is from. That's why you wait. What? <laughs> Hey, he's the coolest kaiju ever, is Reptar. Reptar on ice, the best thing ever. That's where I was afraid of that. Admittedly, I've got a Rodan thing going on, but that's more of an in-joke at this point. Um, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the classic um, Godzilla movies. Uh, everything from the 1954 all the way up to now, except for, of course... 1998 that was horrifying and not in a fun way <laughs> so, yeah there's been a lot of mistakes as far as the kaiju theater thing goes and the latest two American ones the legendary ones were absolutely excellent and what annoys me is when people turn around and say oh there's too much humans involved if they actually watch the Toho Godzilla movies, the, the kaiju are the basis of the human action. The humans are there to react to and try to deal with the situation. And there's a lot of human hap happening and very little Godzilla running around, be, especially in the 1954 version and the early versions. It's all about the people trying to deal with the situation. And they've done the same thing, especially with King of the Monsters. It was humans trying to deal with a situation that is caused by the kaiju. Right. And that is the essence of the, the Godzilla movies. Humans trying to deal with the situation. 
and was really well, cool. Yeah, and you didn't have the humans, you wouldn't actually have the emotions you get from the kaiju. Godzilla would just simply be a massive force of destruction, and that pretty much was it. Except for when he's playing soccer with Rodan by headbutting boulders to each other and bitching about how humans keep it annoying and teasing them. <laughs> Jeez, Godzilla has such a career for him. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just yeah. We won't talk about the cartoons. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a really funny little series on the Toho where um, Toho's YouTube. It's Go 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 to Killa. It's got a puppet Godzilla and his two sons. Oh no, he's got two of them now. Well, he's always had two of them. It's um, they're, they're from different movies. He's had two different sons. One of them was from that movie where it was a little boy basically dreaming about what's happening on Monster Island, and then there was the one that they actually did feature as his son. But it's got both of them, and oh, it's it's exactly what you would expect from a title known as Go 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 Jira. Jeez. And it is brilliant. Yeah, I hate borrowing a term from a different person, but yeah, Monster Island is the, oh my gosh, there's a Kenyan charge movie. <laughs> I, you, I assume you know who G Gamera is, right? Yes, yes. You know the annoying kid that seems to be part of every Gamera movie? there um not personally i've never met him as long as you know the character uh yeah these are uh yeah there's, there's reference to any kid in a kaiju character uh sorry any kid in a kaiju movie has been called, given the t blanket term of kenny because of um kenjiro from the gamera movies mm. that's the annoying kid that basically gives all the exposition and tries to get the, the monster to help yeah. At least it's not um, named after Kenny from South Park. True. So, I uh, just like you asking, why did you pick the non-monster viewpoint, or just uh, just to do something different? It just happened organically. Um, when I actually started, I'd seen a beautiful painting by uh, an artist, Victoria something or other. It was a wonderful vampire painting with uh, vampire girls on her knees. She was looking up. She could see the sorrow in her face. And I decided I was want to see if I can try and make something similar to that. And that's where Ginny, the main vampire, came from, was me trying to do this painting. And then I just thought, oh, I love it. I'll make a little bit of a comic and, you know, I was young and having uh, thoughts and urges, so I decided I'll make a comic of that particular style, and that didn't happen, and it just seemed to, that the only people I was adding seemed to be different in humans, and how then I started working out how the inhumans would actually be living. So they ended up with jobs, they ended up with houses, mortgages, insurance, you know, all the wonderful stuff that we have to deal with in our own typical lives. And, you know, why uh, – I've watched Blade and all that sort of stuff, and the vampires are running multi-million dollar corporate evil entities and stuff like that. Now, sort of, would they really be? Or – because wouldn't that actually – become under scrutiny from the humans a bit eventually or would they just be living at home with their uh, their other halves raising their kids trying to make a crust and generally right. keeping out of the way except for when it's hunting season right yeah I think I've seen the actual argument that it would be a lot easier, easier to become a millionaire as a vampire than it would be a regular person uh, mainly because of the dietary advantages if nothing else yeah, it'd probably be easy to become one, but it's also easier to be noticed if you are one. Oh, I mean, basically, you'd be able to uh, throw up a lot of anonymity shields. You could even make it look like you're your own heir after a little while. Yeah, uh, the amount of uh, people that uh, 
get involved in anything that requires effort becomes noticeable because there's always evidence left behind. But the least amount of effort, it's easier to hide. It is interesting note that your inhumans do have their own methods of uh, eliminating traces. Yes, uh, actually, I stole that from a uh, episode of Forever Night. They, the vampires there have their similar method of removing traces of when a human may know too much. I can't remember which episode it was, but I do remember that uh, sort of like a little team went out to remove evidence, including people who may have be part of that evidence. And all of a sudden, I like the webcomic a lot more. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know. <laughs> first off, I'm a big, huge Forever Night fan. I am, too. Uh, the other catch is that I was worried that you uh, uh, cribbed a lot from the Vampire the Masquerade art role-playing game. Never played it, never read it, don't know anything about it. So much the better. Um, nothing, nothing against the game, don't get me wrong, it's a great game. It's just... it tends to be a little silly in a lot of regards. No, I uh, I actually avoid watching, reading, or having anything to do with vampires for the last, well, 13 years? 2000, since 2006, I avoid just about everything, especially new vampire things. So don't ask me about Twilight. I only know that I made a joke about it in the comic. Um, I don't know anything about modern vampire mythologies that are running around because I avoid it because I don't want to accidentally steal, borrow uh, anything without, you know, because people get upset about that sort of stuff nowadays. Yeah. So I, and I created my own, but they're not, they, they have powers, but they're biological creatures. They, they're they born. They, they make love. They you get married, they die, they, you know, they are what they are. Yeah, I know, you highlighted some of the uh, interesting background features. We won't talk about uh, Sassy's mom and what she has going on. Well, she, she's suffering from a slight case of, um, well, you'll find out if you haven't got that far yet. Obviously, if I'm uh, paraphrasing the title for the chapter... Oh, yes, uh, that's right. <laughs> There's been so many chapters, I've forgotten how half of them are named. I think you actually, yeah, I think you actually used the Wayne's mom. Uh... Yes, I did. Actually, uh, <laughs> the funny thing was, I was actually thinking of an animation done where they changed it to um, uh, Mishi's mom or something along those lines, where it's this uh, cat girl who's getting angry that her three male friends are sort of ogling her mum, and the mum is definitely not doing anything to help. <laughs> it was a very fun little animation, and they, they st uh, started off with um, just editing the, the name for the first time. I can't remember exactly what the name is, but it's so fun. Uh, but that's what I was thinking of when I actually did that one, but it's, it's supposed to indicate that the succubi are by nature what they are. They have those needs, but they are... What's really uh, cool is you've aggressively gone against type in a lot of ways. I mean, in a lot of horror movies with succubi, they, you tend to see them take on, shall we say, some a lot of the lower class elements, uh, especially like tattoos. Well, Sassy's got a tattoo. Oh, I know she has a tattoo. Yeah, Even, but... <laughs> that, that was a bit of a rebellion. I'm rather, just, I'm sorry? Rather significant rebellion against her mum. Uh, yeah, especially in Sucky, I don't have tattoos. As a rule, in my world, no. Their body is perfect. A tattoo would be an imperfection. No. This is opposed to the current thing which is basically put tattoos all over them so yes uh, I wanted to go the opposite way they view they, they, a lot of a lot of the succubi are uh, what's the word I'm looking for uh, supremacists yeah that, that's putting it nicely <laughs> 
Uh, it's a matriarchal society, so the incubi are the subservient um, group, and the succubi are the dominant group. So I, and they are uh, a lot of them are supremacists in regards to how they view also other species. So Sassy being involved with a vampire, which is technically a uh, hybrid from early on, from millennia ago, a, a hybridization between human and and uh, demon. So they're not even pure-blooded anything. Right. Uh, the whole idea was early, early on, there was the capacity for interbreeding. And one of those interbreeding species actually managed to be viable. And that was between human and succubus, or uh, or cubi anyway, the cubi species. And that formed the original vampires. They they had the bloodthirstiness of humans, because humans are notoriously bloodthirsty, with the abilities and the ability uh, of N space, which is I took from somewhere, of the demons to be able to you know, fold their wings back into their back and into a pocket dimension, all that sort of wonderful stuff. It's magic. So see me. Magic is always a legitimate excuse. Yes, but I did sort of make a joke about that as well uh, in one of my little Q and A's about. Uh, how the wings disappear into the backs. And uh, I think uh, Jenny goes on a long spiel about end space, and I actually just copy-pasted something from a physics book and put her over the top of it and had Sassy sort of interrupt and say, look, just say it's magic. <laughs> we won't talk about hammer space. Um, <laughs> geez, I know there's... Uh, there was, looks like there's a big gap somewhere. I mean, I obviously, like I said, I'm just going through the, the um, archives, and I'm about two thirds of the way, and it looks like, especially if you've got current versions, it looks like there's some sort of huge gap between. I'm guessing t- at this point, like 2009 and 2007, uh, 2018. Okay, uh, let me go to my archive. Oh, wrong archive. That's a Nubus Dreams archive. It's basically what I'm noticing is there's either there was either one heck of a slowdown in terms of updates or oh there was a time when I burnt out I completely burnt out for a while and I actually stopped as if, um, I was at one stage trying to do two or three comics a week and back then I had a bit more time to do that sort of thing uh, nowadays not so much so getting one done a week is sort of what I do. Um, sometimes I might try and do one and a half so I can try and make a bit of a buffer. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to find. Uh, where is my archive? I just. There it is. So. So 2000. Well. I'm, like I said, I'm randomly guessing. I'm like, I think I'm like 2009 right now. Okay, so uh, there we go. Sassy's mom. Uh, that's just after uh, you find out about Alexa. Yeah. I liked Alexa. In fact, I'm in the Dream Seeker um, chapter right now. Ah, yes. March 4th, 2009. Gotta love that. Yeah, let's see, 2010. It was a. I've had a few times when I've actually had to take a break. Uh, also, back then is still. I'm working on redoing some of those pages to the new system uh, that I've got. The what I was using originally was uh, GIMP. Right. GIMP is a wonderful piece of software. I recommend it to everyone. However, um, you'll notice that the early pages are all with nice white gutters, and then they suddenly turn to black gutters, and then, oh, pardon me, turns back to white gutters again. You see how far through I've gotten with trying to redo everything and get it all. Then uh, I went from GIMP. I got a copy of Manga Studio 4, 
Uh, I got the professional version of that one. That was not uh, a cheap option. Uh, and then uh, I upgraded that to Manga Studio 5, which then decided to change its name to Clip Studio Pro EX. And that's what I'm using now, and it works wonders. It's an absolutely wonderful piece of software for uh, compositing, uh, drawing, compositing, artwork, anything like that. It's an absolutely excellent piece of software. I recommend it over even Photoshop. Hmm. Sorry, it's really rare to see somebody get uh, Photoshop get second place to pretty much anything. <laughs> well... I do use Photoshop on occasion, I, yeah, um, but when it comes to actually the comic artwork, uh, it's because uh, Clip Studio Pro can do everything like chapters, so I'm able to actually organize my chapters and actually have them as a set file um, structure. It absolutely makes life a lot easier for me. Yeah, uh, backtracking by half a step for the likes of six people in the universe who don't know, GIMP is basically the free version of Photoshop, which has all the functionality but has a li- lacks a little bit in the organization. It is ugly but effective. Basically, yeah, <laughs> no question of that. No, uh, just when GIMP's one of those cool tools for people who are trying to figure out how to use to get some sort of image manipulation going but can't afford the full Photoshop experience. Yeah, um, pretty much. Um, it can do most everything that Photoshop can do. It's extendable, it's expandable, it's free, so it's open source. It's just a very ugly piece of software to use. It does take a bit of a learning curve to try and figure out where everything is. But for the amount that you pay, it does a really good job. Um, and then- and pre-interview, I mentioned there was something of a little bit of an interesting um, debate. One of the things that pops up every so often in superhero debates is that you've got the question of who is derived from who type of situation. And with the vampires, it's sort of interesting because you've got them, even though you've got a lot of people tend to get real pop, think that Dracula was like the first major vampire, it's actually a character called Camara, Camara, yeah, Camaria. Way back in the 1800s. Cool. Who was a lesbian vampire? Really that nice works. Thinking. I like it. <laughs> no, I was just curious if you were aware, uh, how far back you think vampires go? Well, uh, if you look into mythologies, vampires have been part of human mythology since oh, as far back as anyone can really remember there's always been some form of vampirism in mythology whether it's uh, literal uh, sucking of blood all the way back to the sucking of the life forces um, all the way through to that sort of thing Um, so there's mythology going back to some place when an ape-like human poked his head above the grass and found another ape-like human looking like he's got nothing left in him, or her, or it, or whatever. Right. I thought it was very interesting that, by the way, you have different levels of uh, life force sucking in your in your comic. Well, the, yeah, the succubi use more of the arousal and that sort of can drain a person fairly much and they can take it to the extreme as a form like uh, uh, there's one where a guy goes into what looks like a blood doning thing and he doesn't come out again but he actually dies with a smile on his face yeah we I believe Crux Enterprises or something like that uh, the Red Crooks basically a takeoff of the Red Cross yeah uh, basically I believe your version has it they uh, people go in give a little bit of blood get a little bit of money for it and, and leave uh, and leave and part of that's contributed to local hospitals but the majority of it is kept by the vampires yeah so you know, it gives it a legitimacy 
the fun part, of course, is that you do have the couple of people who, as you noted, don't leave. But they don't die upset. Definitely not. Especially when she, basically, they just a. Uh, it's not exactly a major spoiler, so I can get away with it. Is that basically you go in there? Some of the people are, shall we say, having experience with a succubus, or succubus. And she basically drains her entire life for us, and the rest of the body can be used for whatever they need it to be used for. And they got a massive pump system they can pump the blood out with, and the rest of it can be made into uh, uh, food for the wares. With and that way, they can sort of reduce the predation. Yeah, I thought it was a rather clever system, actually. And there's plenty of homeless people around. That's why the way they look at it. Humans are a self-propagating renewable resource. Yeah, it's sort of interesting that the um, various inhumans basically don't really care too much for humans in general. I'll work with them as needed, but uh, uh, avoid them as much as ne necessary and uh, predate on them when required. And Sassy definitely has a fun way of uh, preying on them. Yeah, she uh, doesn't take it too far, which probably annoys her mother. Nonetheless, she is rather effective at it. Yes. And taking a little bit out of many is just as, as good as taking a lot out of one. Well. All right. Well, any closing thoughts on the webcomic? Well, uh, I have no idea where my webcomic is going. <laughs> as I said, I started it in 2006, and it's still going in 2019. Uh, there's... Uh, I have a rough idea of what I'm hoping will happen, and I'm not going to give too much away on that one. Uh, other than that, uh, I hope people will enjoy it for what it is. Uh, we'll be able to see my many, many flaws in it and not be too harsh on it, because trust me, I'm a lot harsher than you are in regards to my flaws in this comic. Uh and just enjoy it for what it is. It's not supposed to be deep and meaningful. It's not supposed to stir great feelings. It's just supposed to be something a little different, uh, a little bit of fun, a little bit of mystery, a little bit of titillation, a little bit of confusion, a lot of confusion on my own. And um, enjoy themselves with it. Cool. And basically, I guess this is the obligatory go ahead and have fun with the plug. Okay, well, Bloodbound is at bloodboundcomic.com. Uh, jump in, put a couple of dollars in the patron if you think that I'm doing a half decent job. Or you can feed one of the cute little abominations on PayPal. And if you don't know what the, one of the abominations are, you'll find them in the comic. They're absolutely gorgeous, cutie little pies. I absolutely love my little abominations. <laughs> And, of course, my obligatory plug is that if you like what you're hearing and you want to see more of it, please support me at my Patreon, at Two Sparrows, T-W-O, and uh, I guess we'll talk to you later. Well, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thanks for having you. Have a good night. Have a good night.